Um, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure at this point to introduce my colleague Brad DeLong, who will moderate this panel. Brad is a professor of economics right here at Berkeley and uh, knows a bit about economic history and about macroeconomics and spent a bit of time at the Treasury Department. So his job is to moderate this panel and keep people under control. Right, Brad? Well, thank you, John. Um, today we have Nicholas Stolatis from TIAA Kraft, Hans Optveld from PGGM, Ian Goltra, still from Forward Uniplan, <laughs> yes, and Don Mosley from Walmart to talk to us about green building and investment strategies on this panel. Our financial markets are, um, we economists think, um, the decentralized long-term collective planning department of the human race. It is the job of financial markets to tell us how valuable assets and bundles of assets are, how useful they are not just today but looking far into the future at amplifying our collective productive capabilities to make and use the things we want and need, and looking not just at the future that is like today but looking at and appropriately weighting the entire fan of possible futures spreading out from this day forward. As we look forward from today, we can see one wing of the distribution of possible futures in which having buildings that are extremely energy efficient is extremely valuable, and in which having buildings that are energy hungry is extremely costly, both because oil may hit and stay at $200 a barrel, and because mobs of angry environmentalists may trigger mass boycotts of what you make, if the buildings a corporation owns are not energy efficient on that August day when the last piece of Arctic Ocean ice melts in some summer in the future. Are these possible futures having an impact on asset prices now? If not, or if they are not having a big enough impact, there are opportunities here. There is alpha if you can figure out which pieces of real estate are green and thus undervalued and by investing in them. If yes, then there are opportunities for profit in both building and renovating green buildings, and perhaps even bigger opportunities in spreading accurate information about which buildings are in fact green. That is, we economists like to say in our ivory tower, the social function of financial markets, investment firms, and real estate portfolios, as we move into a future in which a melting Arctic ice cap and other environmental disruptions from global warming move closer to what might someday become a solid reality. Are financial markets, investment firms, and real estate portfolio choosers adequately performing this social function as the decentralized long-term collective planning department of the human race? Inquiring minds want to know. So let me turn the microphone over to Nick and say only two further words. Eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll be a tough one for me. Uh, they usually have a yellow card for me at meetings just when I carry on. Um, hello, everybody. We've had a great program so far. A lot of great information has been presented. Um, quite honestly, I, I think I can just pack up and go because all, all the key elements have been mentioned uh, with respect to sustainability. But um, that being said, I will move forward. Uh, first of all, sustainability is not a fad. It, it is here to stay. It is a, a, a playing field that we have to deal with as, as investors in real estate. And if one looks at it as truly a triple bottom line opportunity for people, planet, and profit, you are addressing, as an investor, the goals and objectives of the, those who you are investing funds for, either for yourself, if they're your own dollars, or if you're a fiduciary, as we are at TIA Cref, on behalf of uh, our client base who has entrusted their retirement uh, uh, funds to us to invest wisely. And notwithstanding the social element that Brad just mentioned, again, one must remember as an investor, you've got a fiduciary obligation. Uh, you just simply can't do something because it's the right thing to do, quote unquote. There has to be an economic return to it. You are entrusted as a fiduciary with somebody else's money. You're not a charity. There are charities out there that can donate their funds as they desire to promote a specific uh, objective, but as investors, we've got a uh, responsibility to make sure that we have an economic return equal to the other returns. People and the, and the planet are very important for us. Uh, TIA Craft standpoint, for example, our tagline, financial services for the greater good, speaks to the social element that we truly believe in. So my, my commentary just now notwithstanding, 
you know, it is important that one operates in the current environment, and, and there is a demand for socially responsible investing, and the challenge is to be able to balance all of these objectives and be able to move forward. Uh, the question often ha is brought forward, well, do you guys invest in green funds? And from my standpoint as an asset manager, uh, that's a non sequitur. Our properties should be green. Now that raises the question, what does green mean? What is the definition of green? I think what we saw today was a perfect example of the fact that there is no uniformly applied definition for green. The sustainability part of it, I think, is a little bit more understandable. Uh, there's a little bit more uh, technology associated with it, and people get it a little bit better. Green is very vague. People have a hard time um, uh, 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 coming to grips with green. Sustainability fits in with what a real estate investor is looking for. It is an efficient operation, generating a bottom line return. And as we have heard on a number of the panels today, electricity, power, is the big stone in the jar. There's indoor air quality, the water, sustainable sites that, that LEED speaks to, but, but truly electricity is a, a, a big piece of, of the puzzle, regardless of whose, book you're, whose playbook you're looking at. That's why we initiated the portfolio-wide benchmarking of our assets against Energy Star. Alexandra's presentation before was right on the, on the money. You cannot improve that which you can't measure. If you ask somebody, what was your utility bill last month? Does, does anyone here know what their utility bill was last month? Okay, that's pretty good. How about last year? Okay, much fewer. What was the difference between last year's bill and this year's bill? Gee, it was up, it was down. What does that tell you? It actually really tells you nothing. It tells you that you paid more cash last year or less cash last year than you did this year. By benchmarking, you're able to establish what your energy intensity was from one period to the next and be able to track that energy intensity. We benchmarked our portfolio 100%. Uh, and that's 43 plus million square feet, almost 200 buildings against Energy Star's portfolio manager so that we have a tool that allows us to understand the changes in the efficiency of our portfolio from one period to the next period so that we can identify the top performers, identify, as Dave Polk said this morning, the pigs, and be able to really take the lessons from the high performers and apply them to the pigs and be able to bring them up. Quite honestly, the bottom 25% of the uh, spectrum on Energy Star can generate the highest returns for capital investments and for operational changes. Our focus has been initially on the no cost, low cost behavioral changes. The, the Saturday hours, quite honestly, we had a couple of buildings that ran on Sunday for some reason. Someone turned the systems on and neglected to turn them off. It's developing that, that behavioral approach that says, are you considering how the building is being run and operating it properly? When you hear somebody, when I hear somebody that says, well, you know, there's a lot of capital involved in, in becoming sustainable, I understand that individual does not get it. You don't start with capital. You can drive a, a Prius badly and not get the gas mileage you should be able to get with it. You've got to be able to operate your real estate properly, and that is a focus that we as investors are pushing to our third-party property managers to make sure that they appreciate the fact that we're committed. We want our properties sustainable, and, and we want them to be operating as efficiently as possible to be able to generate the best returns to our clients. Um, well, honestly, the labels as labels, as a marketing device, speaks to the reputational risk that investors have to deal with. You have a label, it's a proxy. If you have an energy star label, it's a proxy for good property management practices across the rest of the, the spectrum of activities. Uh, lead certification is, is certainly critical on new buildings. There's no cost on, on new building lead certification. That's a great standard 
uh, when you develop from the ground up uh, existing buildings, that, that can have an economic analysis. And at the end of the day, that's really where we want to um, uh, bring our discussion points internally. What is the bottom line? And just to put a little metric to our Energy Star activities, we've been able to measure our performance over the last two years to show a reduction, almost 7.2 percent reduction in energy intensity across that portfolio, and resulting in almost eight million dollars in avoided electricity costs across that portfolio using no cost, low cost. And then from a social standpoint, that avoided um, uh, over 52,000 tons of CO2, which at the end of the day is what Energy Star is all about as a greenhouse gas emission reduction. And I would be remiss in not mentioning that TIA is also an Energy Star Partner of the Year. And we're very proud of what that says about us as an organization and our commitment to this platform. Thank you. Um, well, you've said everything, so I might as well go home. But since it's an 11-hour flight, I'll, I'll try and uh, <laughs> give you a little bit of color on um, sort of how we deal with it. I think one of, one of the uh, differences um, is that we are invested in real estate only through indirect investments, which means that sort of we have to go through a company or through a fund to get them to do what we would like to see. Um, now, what do we want from them? Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is to create um, a responsible investment environment for our clients. And our clients are pension plans in, in the Netherlands. Um, we cater to about 2.2 million uh, participants. And what they've been telling us quite consistently, actually, is get your act together. Ensure that sort of what you do is uh, uh, responsible. And that's all nice and fine, but uh, just as the previous speaker um, alluded to, we've got a responsibility to deliver performance. And I'm pretty sure that I, um, if I went and sort of underperformed my benchmark for a couple of years, that I would be fired. So um, it's something um, to consider. Now, what we try to build within our portfolio, and this is not just real estate, this is across all the assets we manage, is to ensure that there is a responsible investment policy. And it started out really with um, things like exclusion policies, um, i.e. Uh, ensuring that there is no child labor, that there is no um, weaponry in our portfolio. And that's a tough task. I mean, sort of it's, it's been sort of widely debated, in, in, at least in the Dutch media, whether we, we do a good job at that or not. But we've got about, for instance, in common equities, we've got about 4,000 different positions in our portfolio. So how do you screen all of those? Um, that's difficult. Well, from that, we gradually went into the question of how do you implement policies into um, different uh, asset categories. And real estate is really, you know, a, a key issue there because 40% um, of world CO2 emissions is in real estate. Therefore, it's, it's really a no-brainer to, to look at uh, real estate from an uh, uh, environmental sustainability uh, perspective. Now, I'm, sort of, I'm, I'm showing this slide because sort of one of, one of the companies that clearly, in, in, in the U.S. at least, um, clearly is, is leading in, in terms of uh, sustainability is, is Prologis. Um, they've, they've got all sorts of reporting on uh, um, uh, sustainability. Uh, they've got a story behind it, uh, environmental stewardship. That's always very good to hear. It's something we can, we can work with. However... Um, this is my problem. I mean, it's not the only thing that comes into account, sort of comes into play when you are actually doing your investments. Um, and you need to think about that. So what is the trade-off between wanting to have sustainable portfolios on the one hand um, and making sure that there's a, a, a decent uh, risk return uh, perspective? And don't forget, uh, sort of our, our um, participants in the pension plan, what they do want to see is responsible investment, but on the other hand, they also want to see a reasonable pension uh, at a reasonable cost. So there's a clear trade-off there, um, and we try to find sort of we're trying to find out sort of how how we should go about dealing with that. Now I know, just f flipping back to this one. Now I know that um, 
that there will be people who say, well, you know, don't worry about it. Sort of in the you know life cycle cost and all. In in the end, we'll see um, uh, sustainability coming back as a do as a dominant factor. However, um, this clearly has been caused by um, over levering a company. Um, so you have to watch everything really. Um, so when we started to talk about implementation in our uh, real estate portfolio, particularly in the listed real estate portfolio, uh, um, and I'm responsible for that part of, uh, of the assets, um, we started out by thinking about returns. Um, and sort of the hypothesis was um, sustainability is actually going to add to returns. Why, why would it be adding to returns? Well, first of all, leasing would be better, um, less vacancies for um, sustainable buildings. Um, and higher values by effect of less obsolescence um, um, and just, just a better product uh, on offer. Gradually, we started to become more concerned about the second part of it. Um, there's only, not only return into the equation, there's also risk. And there's severe business risk in sort of not acknowledging uh, sustainability as being an important factor. Um, there's a risk of vacancies and there's a risk of soaring costs for the owner of buildings, but also to the tenant. Um, what we do see is that regulation is being put into place, particularly with uh, regards to emissions and energy efficiency. Um, and I alluded to this 40% uh, of CO2 emissions uh, coming from buildings. Well, clearly, I think governments are going to look at real estate in order to um, uh, get to the uh, emissions targets, which means that these um, emissions are going to be taxed. And in some cases, it's already uh, taking place. I think in the UK, uh, they're starting uh, taxation in 2010, and other countries, I'm sure, will follow. So taxation is a severe risk, uh, and particularly for those companies um, who are not um, taking this into account at the moment. Because if you need to get up to um, a decent level of um, uh, dealing with this, so it takes years. Uh, think about individual individual metering of, um, of of energy and all of that. It, it takes time, so we better start now. And from from this perspective, we're now looking at the real estate portfolio and thinking about what do we need to do. And you can be sure that sort of those companies, the pigs, um, um, will have an issue uh, with us. So, how do we go about doing that? Well, typically we own between three and five percent of a uh, of a company um, in in the listed uh, real estate um, uh, arena and that's really down to fiscal uh, and other um, uh, considerations um, so how do you push those companies to um, raise the bar and that's really hard and one of the reasons why it's really hard is that we lack the metrics really um, we see all these sustainability reports and it's wonderful. I mean, I've had these conversations with companies in Singapore, in Japan, in Europe, in the US. They'll say, well, you know, okay, what is good enough for you? Well, you know, and, and the basic answer we give them all of the time is, well, you know, nothing's good enough, but you know, that's, that's not a target you can work uh, towards. So what we, what we decided is we, we needed to sort of, you know, get something done here. And particularly because it's a global portfolio, we're in trouble because there's different metrics, there's different considerations, and even companies are looking for comparables because taking into a, uh, uh, taking the example of, of two new builds, one being in the in the midst of a, um, a city center, um, a good access to transportation, and uh, but a really lousy building in terms of energy efficiency. If you compare that to a new build, which is um, conveniently placed in a, in a meadow somewhere, uh, no public uh, transport access, and you have to drive towards it. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, damn, I, I never thought I would spend that much time. Sorry, okay, I'm going to wrap this up. But basically, we don't know what is, what, what is better and how do you take these into account. So we commissioned um, um, uh, the Maastricht University um, uh, uh, together with a bunch of other investors to, to actually look at these metrics and to figure out uh, and to come to some sort of a, a benchmark measurement of, you know, um, uh, metrics there. So we can start to actually sort of engage with companies and to talk about sort of where we need to be. 
Um, and basically what it looks at is both at policy as well as implementation. And what my personal frustration is that um, within the sort of implementation part of that, we don't have all the evidence yet. We, we hardly know sort of how we need to measure everything um, and um, the number of companies that is actually sort of willing and able to give some real answers is, is really small. So we're, we're just getting there. Um, final remark I would, I would like to make is, is uh, in terms of, sort of what we're looking at. I think that a lot of the conversations have been going on on sort of the, uh, the new builds uh, on developments, but 98% of our uh, portfolio is existing stock. So we need to think about sort of how we do uh, deal with that and sort of what, what type of retrofits are uh, feasible and um, make economic sense. So that's uh, all I, I wanted to Thank say you. much more. But Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent time discipline. Um, if only our buildings were all as compliant. Um, so, Ian? Can you mind putting your slide number five up? Sure. Yeah. Um, Is the last slide presentation available? I didn't bring slides today, but I, Hans had an excellent one here that actually makes my point rather profoundly, so I'm going to use it. Not possible. Yeah, number five of the last presentation. Uh, next one. So imagine your portfolio is full of the red line. <laughs> and uh, as Hans touched on in the last presentation, um, quite simply, the global debt, the global debt crisis is the is the reason why uh, for our holdings, uh, let me just back up from a forward uh, management where I work in the city. I'm a portfolio manager there overseeing a pool of securities, equities, common stocks in companies that participate in the domestic real estate business. We also have international portfolios um, and the sustainability of these companies is reported to us through the prism of public reporting, of gap public reporting here in the US and a variety of standards globally. Um, and Prologis is a great example of a company that while it has uh, great sustainability communication with its investors, um, faced a much bigger problem. And that problem was common to many, many other companies in the global markets this year and last. That simply was, you know, we call it over leverage now, but three years ago it was appropriate leverage because the leverage was cheap, right? So uh, liquidity was, was readily available, it was everywhere. Cash flow was such that a lot of these sustainable, uh, sustainability measures were um, easy to implement because the cash was available. And now companies are put in a position of having to evaluate what to do with each and every individual dollar. And in this environment where every dollar is so precious, they have to kind of take a step back. And in a sense, we're back to where we were a decade ago with a number of these very, very important issues that are being discussed today. Um, you know, I agree with all of the comments that, the, that these buildings are not um, in the market as a fad. They're in the market because they're better spaces for tenants to occupy. They're more productive, certainly. Um, we've seen that. Uh, I've recently been down to Australia. Um, if you don't build an office building there that's competitive on all these factors, uh, you simply won't get leased up. Um, Dexas is building one Bly Street in Sydney, Australia. Um, that building is you know, going to be a six-star, green-star building and it is being leased up in a market that's very, very difficult. Now, Australia's economy is much healthier, healthier than ours, so that's not entirely surprising. Um, but suffice it to say, in this current environment, companies are really being forced to back up and say, what's um, the kind of capital commitment we, we, we can make now? And some of these issues will be brought back up to the forefront later. Um, but again, in an environment where every dollar is precious, uh, those folks have to go and, and seek out the best opportunity for every dollar of capital. And unfortunately, some of these issues have to go by the wayside on occasion. So selfishly for our investors, we want to work with and invest in those companies that do make this a priority, even in the current environment. And beyond the quantitative approach that we apply of, of calculating that asset value and looking at cash flow and discounting that cash flow and determining a fair value for these companies, we're also assessing their sustainability. And the sustainability relates to the ability of management 
to go beyond simply being in the real estate business, but realizing that part of being a deliverer of long-term value is assessing and putting in place a plan and communicating with its constituents how it's going to arrive at a point in the future where it can deliver value vis-a-vis -vis its real estate policy, choosing infill locations as opposed to greenfield locations. Those infill locations, as we all know, relate to better transit policy. So the extent that they can have their tenants have better access to public transit, a number of the issues that no doubt were touched on earlier today and that are really apparent for any buyer of an institutional quality asset, um, to the extent that they can work with unions on, on labor fronts related to maintaining buildings and constructing new ones. Not a lot of new buildings are getting built right now, but suffice it to say, um, working with constituents at all levels in all dimensions of a real estate company delivers true long-term value to shareholders. I have a list of a number of things that the companies we invest in have done in recent years. I won't go into all the details now, but suffice it to say that the, the general social, environmental, and business policies of these managements that we're investing in to deliver value to our shareholders, to our, our shareholders in our funds, vis-a-vis -vis our funds, uh, those, 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 those thought processes, those disciplines that they employ, um, in our minds, build a brand, build a sustainable company, and leave us in a position of, of being able to evaluate, difficult as it is through the prism of public reporting at times, which of the companies do a better job over long periods of time. And perhaps uh, in follow-up, we can talk about some of those individual issues. But suffice it to say, they're um, excellent management teams in the public space that have had to deal with some of the issues you see here on this chart, where the global credit crisis over the last couple of years has been the forefront issue and the ability to, to, to look deeper into some of the sustainability issues has simply not been present due to this problem. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Don? I don't have any slides either. I, uh, <laughs> and I changed what I was going to talk about. I was at dinner last night, and uh, I asked John, uh, how do I fit in exactly to this d dialogue? Because we own most of our buildings. And, um, and then also at dinner last night, uh, one of the professors here at Berkeley asked me, uh, why are you here? What can Walmart contribute you just build big buildings in big parking lots. So that really boosted my, <laughs> that, that, that boosted my confidence for the day. But then as I was uh, coming back from the first break, um, another Berkeley person that left after the last session, so I'm not sure what that says, but he says, uh, he said, I'm not ready. He said this to someone else. He said, I'm not ready for Walmart to be our hero, but here we come. <laughs> and so, um, I considered leaving at that point as well, but um, it, it caused me to change what I decided to talk about today because there seems to be a, 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 a lack of uh, understanding of the opportunity that it exists uh, with us, uh, with the company I work for and have worked for for the last 20 years, and also um, how that can help the industry as a whole. Uh, as of the end of October, uh, Walmart had globally over 8,000 operating units. And so that's um, 4,300 here in the U.S., 3,900 outside the U.S., operating in 15 countries under 53 different banners, if you take into account Walmart and Sam's, but you take into account <coughs> Vips restaurants in Mexico and Asda stores. And so there's a tremendous opportunity there under a lot of different formats, grocery stores, restaurants, super centers, warehouse uh, facilities. And those, those stores and operations are served by over 2 million associates worldwide. We're the largest private employer in the U.S. with over 1.4 million associates. We're the largest purchaser of electricity in the U.S. that's private, uh, second to the government. And so these, these topics are extremely important to us and important to us as we evaluate and consider um, how to run our business and how to build a sustainable business model. Um, the word green has been used a lot and I appreciated Nicholas's comments about the definition of green versus the definition of sustainable. And most of the things that we've talked about for a good number of years have been centered around uh, sustainability um, I wanted to 
to, to talk briefly about something that happened about five years ago. If you go back about six years ago, I was fortunate in the spring of 2003 to be given the mission statement, which was pretty brief and pretty specific and vague at the same time to, to do what resulted in the two, exper two experimental stores that opened in 2005 in McKinney, Texas and Aurora, Colorado, which were my projects. But later that year, meetings started to occur that were uh, challenging folks and tasking folks throughout the company with their different respective roles within the company with assistance from NGOs and hired consultants to evaluate what the opportunity looked like. In October 2005, uh, our CEO and president at that time, Lee Scott, uh, gave a speech on 21st century leadership. And I wanted just to read a couple of quotes from that speech because it goes to what I think the person that left before this session has missed out on. He said, due to our size and scope, we are uniquely positioned to have great success and impact in the world, perhaps like no company before us. Uh, after a year of listening, the time has come to speak to better define who we are in the world and what leadership means for Walmart in the 21st century. And this speech was given a month after Hurricane Katrina. He then said, nothing brought this home more clearly than Hurricane Katrina. He goes on to say, at Walmart, we didn't watch it. We experienced it. Some of our stores and clubs were underwater. Associates lost their savings, their homes, and a few uh, lost their lives. Um, but then he went on to say, I saw the company utilize its people, resources, and skill to make a big and positive difference in people's lives. And what happened there, um, he, he stated as, this was Walmart at its best. What would it take for Walmart to be that company at our best all the time? What if we used our size and resources to make this country and this earth an even better place for all of us, customers, associates, our children and generations yet unborn? Is this consistent with our business model? And so that was five years ago. Um, we've come a long way. We changed leadership earlier this year. We got a new CEO. Um, he had then to adopt and embrace the three big corporate goals that Lee Scott presented in 2005, which were to be supplied 100% by renewable energy, to create zero waste, to sell products that sustain our resources and environment. Um, I thought it was pretty cool when Mike Duke took over because he's a Georgia Tech engineering grad and I'm an engineering grad. And our president of the U.S. is an uh, engineering grad. And that's great until you remember things that uh, Mike pointed out in his first big sustainability speech in July. And I'm sure you'll appreciate this. My Georgia Tech roots run deep. And the engineer in me likes data. There was comments earlier today about that. I like research. I like metrics. I love an elegant process for arriving at innovative solutions that are both profitable and sustainable. And that means internal audit enters your world. <laughs> so um, it's, it's been an interesting journey because finance was a department I'd heard of um, in the past. And now they uh, accompany us to our budget request. Uh, they have built metrics models for uh, incremental rate of return, not just short term net present value or return on investment, um, but comprehensive models to defend and, and to challenge ideas that are being vetted. And it's grown to the point that we're competing for capital. We just went through the uh, budget process in October, and it was exciting to the extent that there were so many ideas that had been identified as low hanging fruit. And as some of the graphs earlier today illustrated that things that made sense last year that were being requested to be funded again for next year may have been scaled back because there were better ideas. There were better utilizations of capital uh, going forward. So it's, it's, um, it, it's an, an interesting time. I wanted to, to speak to the comment that was made a minute ago into what Art said. Um, and I'm sorry, he's not here, but we've, we've been doing white roasts in California since 2003. Uh, Energy, California Energy Commission even had a, a full page ad that ran for a while that had one of our store managers on the roof uh, celebrating 
the white roofs and trying to get other people to engage. We've had full cutoff light fixtures in our parking lot since 2006, opened our first super center with LED lights in Leavenworth, Kansas earlier this year and are now in negotiations to try to make that our prototypical approach in those budget meetings that occurred in October. We did achieve significant funding to go and retrofit a large number of stores with LED lights. So there's a lot of different aspects to our business. Within the buildings uh, component, I just wanted to share uh, a few things. In Lee's speech of 2005, one of the goals that was established that was, was within four years, which is now, uh, that we would have developed a prototype that was 25 to 30 percent more efficient and will, re and will pr produce up to 30 percent fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we accomplished that. We're currently figuring out, since that building is more controls demanding, and that was talked about earlier today, uh, how to operate and maintain a more complicated building, uh, but we do know that we can build that building. Um, but what's more important is, is the retrofit applications of all of our lessons learned. Those numbers I sh shared with you, 8,000 um, 8, existing stores. We're only going to build 120 to 140 new stores in the U.S. next year. We're going to remodel between five and 600. So that's where the real opportunity exists. How do you uh, touch those stores? Those stores, when they are remodeled, are getting white roofs if they don't have one already. Those star stores are getting LED lights in produce, all the specialty lighting, uh, building mounted signage, uh, exterior building mounted lit signage has been LED since about 2006. Um, water is a huge topic that's under, under discussed, underappreciated. Um, we experimented and tested waterless urinals. We got tired of buying cartridges. Um, we got a one eighth gallon urinals now going in our new stores, our remodel program, 1.2 gallon uh, toilet fixtures. Uh, we've seen it with that coupled with a, a low flow fixtures, uh, half gallon uh, fixtures in our restrooms for the hand washing, 17% uh, reduction in the water usage in our buildings. We have um, drip, low flow irrigation spec prototypically for the last 18 months now, ET irrigation, uh, smart irrigation control spec. All our remodel stores for next year will be re retrofitted with ET uh, um, smart irrigation controls. So there's tremendous opportunities. Um, but that, that, that opportunity leverages the market. The best example of that is LED lights and freezer cases, where we tested those in 2005, started rolling those out, and then it's pretty hard now to go to someone that's built a new store, whether it be Tesco's Fresh and Easy's or Target's new stores with groceries, you're gonna see LED and freezer cases everywhere you go. And that size and the ability to, to um, build or remodel at that scale help leverage the industry. Well, thank you. Um, I suppose I should make our guest from Walmart feel better about some of the people in Berkeley, at least, <laughs> uh, by saying that it was only 15 months ago that I was having beers at Jupiter down the street with a guy whose main line was that because of Walmart and its industry segment, the costs of distributing goods to the bottom three quarters of American households income has fallen by a good half hmm. over the past 25 years. And so it's been an amazing income boost that Walmart, the existence of Walmart and the companies it competes with are worth about 4,000 bucks a year to the average American household. Hmm. Um, any immediate reactions um, to things other people said? Or does everyone want to sit quiet and wait for questions? Well, I, I, would, I would just echo yeah. some of Han's thoughts relative mm -hmm. to um, our ability, especially as portfolio managers, one step removed from being direct investors in property. Mm -hmm. All of these issues surrounding how do you get, how do you translate investment on the margin in sustainability programs back through to the return coming from that investment? It's almost impossible in an right. environment. And I think there's many, many things we can talk about related to that, but that's, that is a key issue that's going to have to be addressed. So is it an information and assessment problem or a yes. modeling problem? Yep. Um, now, if I may provoke you a little bit sure. um, by telling a little family story. 
which was that last month my wife's Prius got totaled by a delivery truck and she had a broken wrist and the husband in me is kind of worried about her broken wrist and physical therapy and so on and so forth. Um, but the economist in me was impressed because a three-year-old Prius with 60,000 miles on it, Geico gave us 4,000 less than we paid for it um, as a settlement which makes me think you do total cost of ownership, $500 a year for kind of scheduled maintenance, 500 gallons of gas at an average price of $2 a gallon, um, and $1,000 a year in depreciation. That's a total cost of ownership of 2,500 bucks a year for a car. Compared to our suburban neighbors who purchased the behemoth SUVs two and a half years ago, as they were still doing. You know, the golden sun arc of the god Ra, or whatever <laughs> it's called. Um, you know, the infamous Escalade, which has the world's worst press um, this week in terms of its stability on the road in midnight while the driver is looking backwards. And you know, they've had not only $3,000 a year gasoline costs, plus maintenance, they've also had about $3,000 a year fall over the past three years in the market price of the vehicle as people's views of what's an appropriate car to drive and what future gasoline prices are likely to be um, have changed. So if I were running um, a portfolio right now, I would be looking forward to a world in which at some point over the next three years, cap and trade or some equivalent passes in the United States and starts to bite and in which Europe decides it has to go one better than the United States, and anything the United States does, the European community has to show that it should do better. And thus, I'd be looking forward to an environment in which energy costs were likely to be rising and possibly rising very, very steeply, and trying to build that into my current models, both as a risk to be avoided um, and also as an opportunity, right? That to the extent that you can find assets that are extremely energy efficient right now or that have extremely energy efficient buildings embedded in them, they are powerful negative beta assets to have. They're powerful sources of insurance. And so funds should be working to find them and companies like Walmart should be working to make the pitch to investors into the market as a whole that we are already becoming a company where that you can invest in without worrying about the consequences for our bottom line of rapidly rising energy prices. And yet I don't hear as much of this in the market chatter as I thought I would by now. Can I just call it Yes, that? yes, excellent. Um, it's our little secret, so okay. it won't go without sort of beyond this room. That's exactly what we do, actually. Sort of what, what we do in our modeling, and we we needed to think hard about sort of you know how do you implement this. Mm -hmm. But our our thoughts were exactly like this, um, and obviously sort of well we're we're trying to generate alpha, so we we don't believe in market efficiency anyway. But apart from that. Um, we, we, we thought long and hard about sort of how do you translate this into, into deciding which, which companies you want to be invested with. And there's two thoughts there. First uh, thought, uh, thought is, well, you do exactly this. And that, that's what we do. We actually sort of model in our proprietary modeling. What we do is we say, well, these companies are going to have assets that trade at lower yields and will have better income and therefore it looks better on paper, and therefore we are going to select these companies above and beyond other companies that are lagging. But there's another thought as well, and that second thought is, well, you know, perhaps I don't want to spend my time with the companies who actually have got this right. Perhaps I should engage with those companies who don't understand this, spend my time with them, and get them to, to act, and therefore you will see valuations um, uh, getting better, um, and that will be something you want to capture. So it's a bit of both, and I think what we're trying to do is, on sort of, you know, the companies that are on the forefront of this, we're sort of building it into our models, we're saying, hey, these, these companies are probably, they're likely to do better. On the other hand, we're going to spend some time with those companies that are left behind and try to get them to move, because, you know, there might be price impact in that as well. But then, then again, so we know it's it's our secret. That's one of the ways we generate alpha. And as far as the utilities costs, I mean, yes. we saw the price of oil drop dramatically when certain efficiencies and, and reductions in demand occurred. The market turned around pretty drastically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of years ago when oil was was 
shooting upwards and approaching its, what, $149 market cap. Um, yeah, everyone was expecting it would never, ever, ever go below 100 and a quarter. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we're at, what, 78, 79, mm -hmm. 74, depending on, on what day of the week it is. Mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty hard to try to forecast mm -hmm. specific dollar amounts. I, I think it'd be safer as, an, as a real estate investor to, to view uh, trends mm -hmm. and the expectation that, well, utilities costs are probably going to rise more, you know, as so we heard Catherine this morning, probably from reg regulations and codes. You know, the, the government is going to have probably a bigger say in, in the cost of your utilities than supply and demand. You know, every solar panel that goes up on someone's rooftop is, you know, a barrel of oil less that we have to import. Mm -hmm. So your, your demand for these utilities will always be there as utilities, as generic power producers, you know, power that you're going to consume, it's the source is going to change. Mm -hmm. So you really can't say, well, I'm going to model out on you know, $100 oil or $80 oil. I don't think anyone really has got a good handle on that on a long-term basis, short-term perhaps, but real estate being a long-term investment vehicle, you want to position yourself to be responsive. So you're addressing the regulatory risk. You know, when, when Washington and New York and California mandate labeling, and you haven't gotten onto Energy Star, well, you've got a steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. What's the problem in getting on it right now and getting ahead of the curve? Mm -hmm. Being ready, being a, a pioneer, being able to truthfully say that you're uh, a pioneer. I, I think one of the biggest risks that some companies run today is greenwashing. You know, they start touting all of these wonderful things that they're doing, and when you peel back the layers, it's really nothing. Mm -hmm. It's all smoke and mirrors. Uh, you know, Doug mentioned before how many buildings are being registered. I often wonder, do we have the metric, how many of those registrations actually go to LEED certification? It's very easy to register. You, you pay a fee and, and you're registered. The implication is, I'm going to take that to certification. I bet you there's quite a number of people out there that have no intention of going for LEED certification. They just want to say they're LEED registered. Mm -hmm. So. As consumers, we need to be aware of greenwashing. As investors, we absolutely have to be aware because there's your, your reputational risk. You get caught spouting off facts and figures that really are made up, your credibility is going to go down. And unless you're a fly-by-night operator, you can't take that risk. And, and it, it requires incremental steps to make sure that what you do, you get right. And, and I, I would give credit to, to Don, um, truly when you've got scale and scope on your side, you can make technological advances much more economically feasible when you can spread the risk across a, a broader platform. Um, you know, case in point, we did the Change of Light campaign last year. Yeah. We distributed 255,000 compact fluorescents to every one of our building tenants, office building tenants, and, and we relamped every one of our almost 12,000 apartment units. Just went ahead and did that because it was economically the right thing to do. Yes, maybe we didn't realize all the savings on, on the apartments because the tenants paid for that, but we were changing light bulbs anyway. <coughs> Put compact fluorescents, we only change them once every two or three years instead of once every six months. Mm -hmm. So we saved some labor, saved some materials, and had an opportunity to educate our residents hey, here's what you need to do. They were sensitized and open to that educational process, which as owners is part of our responsibility too because when you get buy-in from everybody, it makes it so much easier to make forward progress. Okay. I'd like to talk about yeah. that uh, partners, partnership opportunity. Um, I think you've, you've got to find your way to grow with the technology instead of waiting for it. An example of that is our tenant spaces in our super centers, uh, they don't pay their own utilities. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, leasing that space to them, but their motivation uh, may not be what we want it to be. Uh, when the two experimental stores opened in 2005, because of all the other initiatives associated with the buildings, I wanted to apply those same standards to those tenant spaces. The folks in the tenant leasing group at that time said, 
we have no control of that. Those are tenants, there's agreements in place, and they're master agreements. They're some of the same tenants that are in some of our other units. And so I said, well, let's just talk about the signage. We started out with LED lights for the backlighting of our building mounted signage. And we started with green and red because green and red came along before white. White was hard to get to. And then white came along. And we went to these tenants and they said, well, we're not going to do it because we don't see the return on investment because it costs more and you pay our electric bills. So we found that we could negotiate with our scale of purchase and the scale that they presented to get their price as part of our price. They bought that ribbon to put in their signs, but it was in it, but it helped drive our cost down even further because there was more mass to that, to that opportunity. So those type opportunities exist. Now, within the last few months, we've been meeting now five years later, and the same folks are saying, okay, what are we going to make them do now? And so that we've, we've come a long way. What do we feel comfortable requiring them to do? Because the industry's there, the technologies are there, or we can help them be there with us. And it's not that we're trying to impose things on them that we wouldn't impose on ourselves. It's just that they need to, to stay up with what is current and technologically possible. And a lot of them, either they don't know, or most of them care, they just need, they need help. And so a lot of those opportunities exist, even in our format, where we do have lease tenants. Okay. My only comment would be, uh, you know, I touched on in my opening comments that the idea that <coughs> management teams that are willing to think about the things like sustainability end up being the folks who are well situated in the real estate market. They have competitive assets. And, you know, our modeling is similar in the sense, sorry, but, you know, relative to this thinking about, you know, low cap rates are there for a reason. You expect growth. If you're an owner of that asset and the yield is low on an ongoing basis, you're expecting growth. You're expecting growth, why? Because there's going to be demand for that space. Why is there going to be demand for that space? Because the asset is well located. It's competitive in the market. And so it, we find ourselves having a very positive correlation between our security selection in our portfolio and the kinds of management teams that are thinking about these issues. Thank you. Um, I guess now it's time for questions. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Chris Pike with uh, USUBC. I have a quick um, observation, just, just to try to throw this out. Um, obviously, there's a ubiquitous emphasis on energy and energy efficiency. That's fantastic. That's the age that we, we're in. There's also, all of you have mentioned the push for quantitative metrics, which, again, reinforces the push or is, is, is in line with the push toward energy. One of the issues that is a little more ambivalent across the panel is this issue of, at the same time, are the product we put up, the spaces we build, are value, the, the highest value commodity is the indoor environment and the quality of experience, the, the occupant satisfaction. That's an element that is, if I was to be engaged in this discussion about the distinction between uh, energy and sustainability more generally, this issue about how well does the space work for the occupants, which is actually one of the highest value components for the economic productivity of the space, yet the most difficult to assign the kind of energy star type metric to. I'm curious as to how you, and my, my obs two observations about this real, real quick. One is, is saying this, are we learning the lessons of the 70s when we let the energy efficiency pendulum take us to a place where buildings were not, doing, were not as satisfying to occupants and kind of put, put a fly in the whole soup? And are we learning the lesson of things like FEMA trailers, where we go, we, we, maybe we didn't have a metric for volatile organic compounds off-gassing the FEMA trailers, but whatever the marginal cost of that stuff in those FEMA trailers, I don't think anyone cares right now. <laughs> so anyway, I just, I'm curious about your, your, your perception of the importance of that issue and how, you're, how you see it as an investment issue. Uh, I can jump in a little bit on that one. Um, that whole indoor air quality is so ephemeral it, very, very difficult to put a number to it. Uh, you see all of the, uh, you know, the metrics that come out from that very small part of the industry that, that can measure it intelligently speaks to it being you know, 30 or $40 a square foot, not the three or $5 a square foot that maybe utilities represent and, and, and is a larger component for the tenant as an occupant. Um, I don't believe that enough human resources areas understand it themselves. 
they do understand, because I've heard reports back from both our own as well as other uh, uh, human resource areas that their new employees, their new hires are beginning to ask the question, what kind of facility will I be based in? And right now, maybe people can't be too selective in finding a job, but when that pendulum turns around, the expectation, I think, is that people can say, oh, you're not in the LEED certified building, or you're not in the green building, uh, maybe I don't want to work for you. It's one of those decisions. People make an economic decision. I need a job. I don't really care where I work. When it goes and you have a choice, you're going to choose where you want to go. And, and from evaluation, we were talking with, with Scott before, you know, there may not be a green premium, but I think there will assuredly be a brown discount. You know, if you're not green, you're not going to be able to achieve market rates. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm Kathy Fogel with the uh, Energy Efficiency Planning Sector at the California Public Utilities Commission. And um, so we've talked today about a number of different issues, critical peak pricing, um, carbon pricing. Um, we've talked about risk management here a lot in this panel. Um, We've talked about labeling a little bit. We're going to hear a little bit more about that, which will be important in creating um, consumer or tenant demand, I think. But I was wondering about uh, sort of a, another thing that we haven't talked about very much, which is, um, I guess I'll call it a leadership council or leadership circles. So we're hearing, I'm hearing when you're talking about risk management that you're, one of your standards is, are they registered for EPA portfolio manager? Another is, are they lead registered? kind of a low bar maybe, and then are they LEED certified? And I think in California where we, we, we will have a cap and trade system in place starting 2012, we will have carbon prices. We, um, uh, and about right now about 15% of the emissions reductions for the state are intended to come from energy efficiency um, in the utility sector. So um, we also have these ambitious goals as I mentioned by 2030, all new commercial buildings being zero energy buildings, or nearly zero, and uh, deep retrofits, more around the level of, of, um, of existing buildings going down to zero energy buildings. I think the goal adopted in the California Long-Term Energy Efficiency Strategic Plan is that hopefully 50% of existing buildings will be retrofit to zero energy by 2030. So we're talking about raising the bar quite a bit with those very ambitious goals. And when we're sitting in the regular agency looking at our toolbox. Um, one thing that's been used effectively a lot in other arenas is these leaders councils, leadership councils. And um, but we haven't talked about it today. I'm wondering if you think that would be an effective um, mobilizer in this arena to um, have that collection of companies that really wants to go much deeper than um, some of these other ways we've, we've, we've mentioned, say, committing to retrofitting you know, all their buildings to zero energy by such and such a date, or you know, 25% by such and such a date, and, uh, and getting that uh, public you know, green recognition that would not be greenwash in that way, a leadership council, would, would that be helpful, that kind of thing? For leading, leading builder, owner, investor, developers, I, I do think it would be helpful, yes. Because to the extent that folks step forward and apply standards, and the standards are measurable and reportable, it's right. of course helpful. And right. I, guess, I guess maybe the more question is, how do you, how do, you do that from your perspective? How, do, how would you make such a leadership council happen? What would be, do you need, do you need incentives, financial incentives, or is just the public recognition? I, th I think okay. just just from a European perspective, because I, I've been talking about this um, in, in Brussels um, a week or, or two ago with companies who said, well, you know, we want to sort of take this further. And that, that that's nice, but um, what you sort of, one of the risks is that you get into a situation where everyone pats each other on the back, you know, you're doing a good job, wonderful. Uh, well, you'll have wonderful meetings. And then essentially nothing happens to the wider uh, economy and sort of what what I would be looking for is something that actually sort of would would take the whole thing and raise the bar for for the for the industry as a whole mm -hmm. and perhaps it works that way perhaps they'll just need sort of leaders to show you know this is the way you do it 
but I think that um, it's important also to be inclusive and to ensure that some of the, the guys who do not uh, know how to do it, so that they're, they're being helped. And certainly I think there's a, a huge correlation between um, how well informed and how, um, uh, how much resources are being spent on, on the issue uh, and sort of the size of, uh, of companies and uh, just the, the ability they have to address the issue. So I, I, think, I think you should take that into account, and that, that's certainly something I would... I, would yeah, I think Martin Townsend on the last panel, just before the break, made the point that if people walked into a building and said this, and the building was labeled an underperforming building, mm -hmm. boy, the economics in that market would change in a hurry, would they not? Mm -hmm. And in that way, I think, uh, and, and again, part of the frustration you heard me mention up front, the inability for companies to deliver to investors exactly the capital being placed and then the return on that capital to the extent we have standards and we can begin to articulate and develop a vocabulary around the idea of how much investment in what areas creating what returns as investors that's fantastic information right mm -hmm. but yeah. I, I would say in the case of a nearly zero energy building you know we're not talking about conservation you can't conserve yourself to a nearly zero building because you need to be able to turn lights on unless we develop you know some facilities that we don't have, it really implies technology. It, you know, to get there, you need to have the technology. And right now, that technology is not cost effective. The reason we don't see many more photovoltaics out there is their, their, their economics just don't work. If I put up a dollar to buy a photovoltaic, will I get at least a dollar eight back? Because as an investor, I need to get that. And we have the, the incentives out there to try and make the economics uh, more viable. And I would think, and I'm not an expert on this, so this is purely uh, an opinion here, but we're looking at photovoltaics on industrial buildings in California. Mm -hmm. And what I'm being told is that if we install, install a, a, a PV array on a building and that building goes vacant, and I now have this power being generated and no use for that power in the building upon which it's being generated, I can only sell that power back to the grid at wholesale rates. Well, it barely makes any sense at retail rates. It certainly makes no sense at all for, mm -hmm. for wholesale rates. And when you factor in real estate, there are vacancies that occur in real estate. It is a common, common event. How can anyone be con expected to make an investment in PV recognizing that there will be a period of time during the holding period where you're penalized because you took the right step of installing PV on your rooftop to make it a nearly zero building. That's an example, in my opinion, where you know, the, the, I'll call it the government, although I, I realize it's not necessarily the government, mm -hmm. but where you have regulatory bodies that have an impact in this environment that are setting up additional barriers to get to the goal that everyone says we want to get to. So it's almost not only a lack of incentive, it is a disincentive pushing this, the, the state away from being able to achieve that goal. Unless the net metering was different. Yeah. <laughs> only you could demand that workers be bioluminescent as a condition. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we on. more nuclear plant. Hi, uh, this question's for uh, <laughs> Philip Liu on that uh, high school of business. Uh, this question's for Don. Uh, so, so Walmart is doing a lot of great things around sustainability and energy use in their um, stores, but I think the larger question, this is Berkeley, so we're not gonna let you off that easily. Um, <laughs> so I mean, the, the larger issue is kind of the business model of people driving their Escalade to load up at Walmart to buy things that were made in China. So. This is issues with your supply chain. Are you working towards improving that? And sort of maybe improving the whole business model where are you encouraging tra public transit to those giant super centers or maybe building them in older downtowns, downtown locations that are you know, easier to get to without driving? I mean, that's, I think that could be the larger issue you know, that, that a lot of people still have an issue with. The um, sustainability efforts have been divided up into 12 different networks, facilities being one of those. And so there are many different aspects of the business that are being uh, evaluated. I don't know that it's been done. It would be interesting to see what the carbon footprint of a delivered unit of merchandise to 
the average American would be if they bought it at Walmart in their SUV compared to all the street corner businesses in San Francisco, for example. Um, when the fleet uh, challenged itself within the first three years after that speeds to reduce their um, mileage efficiency by 25%, uh, they exceeded that goal. And in the process of doing that, they figured out that their metric needed to change. They were focused on miles per gallon and realized that the true metric ought to be uh, units per trailer because they figured out how to get more pallets on the truck in the process of dissecting how we, how we uh, look at our business. In 2008, they traveled, um, they delivered 3% more pallets driving 90 million fewer miles as a result of that uh, assessment of the business. So there are um, many different areas of our footprint that can be and are being evaluated uh, that have uh, tremendous efficiencies as a result of the model by which we operate our business. Um, I, I can't um, tell my customers what to drive when they go to our stores. Um, but that being said, our buildings are getting smaller. The, uh, that aspect of our footprint has been evaluated. Uh, the buildings uh, that we're building today are 30% smaller on average by prototype scale than they were just three or four years ago. So we're trying to figure out through our logistics and through our inventory process systems and all of that that we have available to us through better technology and as a result of our scale to serve that larger growing volume of customers in a smaller building. Uh, the urban markets are a challenge. The, the operational method that we've uh, developed, um, we're leaving that to other, other businesses right now. And that, and, that, and that part of the market's being addressed. Um, but we we are we are aware of those criticisms and concerns, and categorically have tried to dissect our business with that uh, logistical component being one example. Waste is a huge opportunity. Last year, we diverted 57 percent of our waste from landfills. This year, it'll be tremendously larger. Um, our our scale. Uh, and how we are able to collect that back is unique and, and has components that other distributors or retailers can't provide. And we've recycled over 25 billion pounds of cardboard uh, as a company because of how we, how we are structured and how we um, make money through waste. Um, we are giving away food because laws changed that allow us to give away close dated food, whereas before there were liabilities associated with that. Uh, we're going to give away about 100 million pounds of food this year to Feeding America because that opportunity exists and we've created those logistical avenues. So there's, there are things that that scale and size and format can do that others can't do and we're trying to make that better. We have a responsibility because we are structured in that manner. And, and then if, if, you, if you have the chance to read that leadership speech, it talks about that. It talks about those criticisms. It talks about what burden we should own that may be prior to that we didn't. But we have close alliances with environmental defense and with a lot of NGOs. Uh, we have worked closely with UC Davis and. Rocky Mountain Institute and NREL on energy aspects of our business. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot to be appreciated about a business structured as ours is and, and what good it can do through recycling, through fleet efficiencies, distribution efficiencies that I think are either not appreciated or misunderstood. Thanks for the answer. Okay.
My name's Arthur Young. I didn't identify myself earlier. I occasionally teach a generic marketing course through um, Extension, and I teach the country's only course in how to market sustainable, sustainably or sustainability. Um, there was a key word that came up, greenwashing. And I'd just like to make an observation and throw out some information, two, two, two short items. Um, a, a company called Terra Choice did a survey of six big box retail stores. They looked at, the, at 1,753 items that were carried by all stores and questioned on a scale that they had created how many items were greenwashing. To yourselves, take a guess. Of 1,750, how many, excuse me, were not greenwashing? 50, 100 out of 1,700? 25, 20? One a towel company, Cascade. There's a lot to be learned in that, and one of them is that one can lie by omission. You're still legal, you're still honest, but you can point to some piece of, a, of green certification, something that you're doing that's great, and kind of, uh, you know, forget about the other parts. Um, that is a major problem. Now, the AIA, uh, the young architects of the AIA, just about three weeks ago, came out with a, a new idea, and it's called the 2030 Architectural Challenge. You can go to the AIA website. Um, they're challenging design firms, and I'm gonna turn this around and ask if you think it's at all can practical. Ask, can I ask if you'd ask a question? I'm actually giving what I think is an important piece of information. I'll make it short, I promised. The AIA, ch okay. the AIA challenged uh, the, the young architects challenge architectural firms to look at their entire body of work and rate how well are they moving forward towards sustainability. And they created a, a measurement system. Not for any one building, but for the work they do. Now that's the architectural world. So I'm wondering if that kind of schema would it all work for the green investment world in terms of real estate investment. And if you could see, see that, I'm not asking you to, make a, to even come up with an answer, but just to check the AIA website for the, um, uh, that, that piece of the website and the, and the measurement. And see if you think that maybe next year or the year after when we meet, um, you uh, might have an this answer. Is, this isn't a question, this is a request. They do something and report yes. back next year. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hi, I'm Tom Inger with UBS Realty Investors and wanted to ask Don a question about uh, Walmart's strategy uh, and their investigation of solar power. Uh, like Nick said, it's, it's very thin and very difficult and it's a lot, uh, well, very subsidy driven. And I want to know kind of how you're finding ways to implement it or reasons why you're not. We, we, ev we evaluated uh, solar. Uh, the first evaluation was years ago with our store in the city of industry, but most recently with the experimental stores, we did building integrated PV at McKinney. We did roof mounted at Aurora. Um, it was quick and easy to figure out that roof mounted was the more economical footprint, but that being said, it's still cost prohibitive in, in most markets. Mm -hmm. The solar that we have done has been limited today to California and Hawaii. Um, those have been done through power purchase agreements with third parties. Um, we did um, 20 originally. We've signed up another group. We've committed to doing at least 20 here in California between now and 2011. Um, additional stores or Sam's Clubs. One of the ones that is existing is a distribution center, so those are somewhat large installations. But the uh, economics still aren't there. and. Um, we're, we're running a business, and um, we try to find the opportunities that do exist. We entered into an agreement with Duke Energy earlier this year with a wind farm in West Texas. So there are renewable opportunities with energy that have presented themselves. Uh, we've got about 350 stores that are getting about 15% of their power from that wind farm. But the, um, there are challenges. In that scenario, where there is wind, uh, there are no stores. So you've got distribution issues at, at, at some point. So there's, there's still a long way to go um, for solar and wind. Good, good. Okay. So the only two states that had a high enough subsidy was California and Hawaii? Those are the only two that we have invested in it so far. Right. 
Okay, well, thank you. I well, do you have to Actually, real quick yeah. follow on that for Don. A couple of years ago, I recall reading that, that I think it was Walmart was looking to recapture the excess heat from their coolers and, and set up little you know, turbines on the larger centers. And I, I haven't seen or heard anything further on that. And I was just curious if that was something that ultimately didn't work. Is it you know, running like a charm and it's just not enough? Or? I'll talk fast. Um, the experimental store we did in Aurora had a stit built mechanical yard that was an integrated system that shared heat between the refrigeration equipment and the HVAC equipment. That store was followed in 2007 by a group of pilot stores that had skid built, compartmentalized, integrated hydronic systems. We piloted a set of stores in 2008, 2009, and now in 2010, two of those being recently opened in Sacramento. Those stores are running about 40% more efficient than our fleet. But those stores are more complicated, the controls are more complicated, and there's less redundancy because now you have one hydronic system running the whole thing. So if it goes down, you're in a big uh, okay. problem. So we're trying to make sure before we roll that into our prototype, which we feel close to comfortable doing, that we can support it, that we can control it properly, maintain it properly, We've got water now to deal with water, um, water thirsty equipment in some instances. So we've got to evaluate: is that the right thing to do in some parts of even California, mm. where we have water issues? Where's the balance between water and energy? So there's a there's a lot that goes into those decisions, but right. we're getting very close. Okay. Well, let me thank all our panelists very much. But I think was a wonderful question.